Hello. Uh, glad to be with you guys today. I'm Dave from New Song, and also I'm a part of Zealots, which is a human development organization. I want to announce today a new software. And it's really cheap. It, actually, it's free. It's called NUMA. Yeah, NUMA software. And actually, the resources, you, they're unlimited. And you, you don't even need a mobile phone. You can get it anytime. And if you download it, you may actually get visions and dreams and strategies. And you're going to find that, man, maybe it could actually be supernatural. Today I felt as I was listening to the presentation, I go, wow, that is awesome software. And I said, man, I hope we spend as much time digging into listening to the Holy Spirit. Because I said, man, if we do, maybe we get some clear direction how to impact Los Angeles. Look at that, Together LA. When you see Together, what does that conjure up in your mind? Does that mean we all come together as all the churches and seminaries and colleges that we're supposed to play together? Realistically not, right? But somehow in our minds we think, man, we gotta do it all together. But the truth is, Jesus even stepped over people to heal one. He didn't heal everybody. So the reality is you may not be together with everybody in LA, but just that thought makes you think you have to go to maybe all the conferences or all the big prayer meetings. You don't, and you shouldn't feel guilty. LA, when you think about LA, how do you define that? Do you define it from a cartographer's perspective where LA is a geographical dotted boundary? Or could it be LA City has about 4 point, or 3.8 million people, and then LA County has about 9.8 million, and then the six counties that would be considered Los Angeles to people who are social cartographers, that comprises about 21 million people. LA County has 88 incorporated cities, 140 countries represented, and 86 languages. So when you talk about Los Angeles, what Los Angeles are you talking about? So maybe it's our labels that where we tend to oversimplify things. And we say, yeah, we're supposed to be a church for the city. Well, what part of the city? The churches I see off the planet are actually churches that are kind of just hipster oriented. When I think I work with a lot of nerds, and I also see people who don't know, normally go to church that actually wouldn't be attracted by some of the venues that we're actually trying to create. So I read a passage, and I was meditating on this really cool text, and I heard it the other day, and I said, man, I want to share that today. It's 2 Corinthians chapter 10, 2 through 6, and it says this, for though we walk in the world, we do not fight according to the world's rules of warfare. The weapons of the war we're fighting are not of this world, but are powered by God and effective at tearing down the strongholds erected against his truth. We are demolishing arguments and ideas, every high and mighty philosophy that pits itself against the knowledge of the one true God. We are taking prisoners of every thought, every emotion, and soon subduing them into the obedience to the anointed one. I'm a student, and I've gone to graduate school, and I hope I continue to learn. And I love intellectualism. I love the ability to have a dialogue and have conversations about deep things. I'm an introvert, so I naturally gravitate towards that direction. But my belief in this day and era in the evangelical community is that I think we now have become intoxicated with insights. And insights are actually the illusion to transformation. Where just because you have an insight doesn't mean you're naturally changed. Whereas we sit in a service or we go to a seminary class or we go to a conference and you sit there and you get chills because suddenly there's a truth that has been unveiled to you that has a particular nuance. It's new to you, but it's really not new to maybe a lot of people. But because you got that chill and because you got that new insight, you think you're changed. And my belief is we're not. 
So I think what's happened in America is we've become insight driven and intoxicated. And in our stupor, we've become pragmatically driven. Pragmatically driven in that it's all about strategies. If you look at generationally, and I've lived now a little bit through the church growth movement, it initially started with this idea of a comfort driven church where we're supposed to make it comfortable for people. My question always was, well, what's uncomfortable? And did Jesus make people uncomfortable? But it was a comfort-driven orientation. And then it moved to a cause-driven focus. And then now it's kind of mixed up with a cool component, is how do we mix cool and cause? But what you find all around this is that our institutions are becoming more secularized and the church is becoming more encased in the box where we start to think that we're really growing big and strong because we're deep in our thoughts and our insights, but the truth is we're not truly impacting the culture. So I asked God, I said, God, what, what are you doing? And how do we need to deal with this practically? Because we love truth and we need to always uphold truth. We need to be students of your word. But how would you approach LA? I mean, when you look at Los Angeles, what do you see? What do you think he sees? Do you think he sees lines? Do you think he sees colors? Do you think he sees enclaves? Do you think he maybe even sees individuals and he knows the names? And then it drove me to a passage, John chapter four. And I said, man, maybe that's an interesting case study on how to approach a city. The first thing I, I, I think about is when we're thinking about doing evangelism in a city, we think about church planning. And I said, that's awesome. We should always plant churches. But could it be that churches are already planted? What if the old churches could be revitalized? And what if the new church is the business or the network or the artist guild or the community group that's activist? What if that form of church is there and what's actually needed is a new software called the NUMA software to guide that church, to give it resources that are unlimited, to be the teacher, to be the comforter, and it's free. So I looked at John 4 and I said, wow, that's a pretty cool passage. Because in John chapter 4, Jesus goes into Samaria. The way up to through Samaria is an interesting way. Because, you know, he didn't want to go like the typical strategic way, which would be a long directional way, away from that lo location. And I thought about the strategies, again, about our normal church planning strategy and how we would do it. It costs 100,000 bucks at least for three years. They have to be credentialed. They have to go through all these vehicles, which are all, again, good. But then one has to ask, are we creating bottlenecks so that maybe we're actually impeding the free flow of the Spirit of God, which is known to work amongst the weak and the poor and sometimes even the illiterate? Who are we really going after? Is it really just people like us? So if we're to look at that city, will we see it the same way Jesus did? How would we approach it? Jesus had every tool available to him. He could have literally had angels singing. I mean, millions of them, and pointing their fingers, saying, this is the one, follow him. He could have had a light show, a 4D effect, and had surround sound. The earth could have literally shook at the sound. But how did Jesus approach that city? He spoke to one person. And when he spoke to that one person, she went and told her all her friends. And all her friends ran to Jesus. Eastern Orthodox tradition says this one woman is Fontili. Her name was not known, but then at the baptism, the tradition says that they gave her the name Fontili. And when they gave her that name, this woman became known as equal in importance as the apostles in the Eastern Orthodox tradition because her influence started to go beyond that village actually to the nations. In fact, she became so important 
that Nero was afraid of her, and they tormented her family and massacred them. And then she still would not recant. So Nero says, I'll give you one more shot at recanting. Say your Jesus is not real, that you're not going to follow him. And she refused. So they threw the woman at the well into a dry well where she became a martyr. And the Eastern Orthodox Church celebrates her sainthood the fourth Sunday after Easter. It's known as the Sunday of the Samaritan woman. The power of one. Yeah, it gets confusing when you just think of strategy and you think about all the things you need when you compare yourself to the full service churches all around you. Yeah, it's really impossible, but what if it's in your hand? And what if it's not about the many, but it's actually about the one? What if it's really true that John 5 is real, that Jesus only did what he saw his father doing? What if you walk the cities of LA or the cities around here in the counties and God led you to that one? Could it be that one person could change the city? And that could be the most strategic thing you could do. So maybe it's not about human strategy, nor it's all about our credentials, which again are important. I understand we need to validate. But maybe it's about teaching people how to follow the one and then listen to the people, to the streets, to the saints, and to the spirit. I grew a church, and as I grew this church 20 years ago, I started in my apartment, and it grew really fast. And we were at, at Disneyland, and at Disneyland, uh, it was pretty amazing to me uh, to see, you know, thousands of people streaming in, average age 28. But then something struck me right before I went on stage. I heard a voice, and that was unusual because I come from a tradition that doesn't hear voices. And suddenly I heard a voice, and I don't hear voices often, but I just heard, is this it? And it was my definition of success. And then from that became a, a journey into what is it to God? And I didn't like to talk about it because you know how you are when you're starting churches and you're building your ministries. You're just busy. You're just trying to keep up. You're memorizing your manuscripted sermons and you're working with people. You're just doing things. So you just put on Saul's armor from generations in the past. And we know something doesn't fit, but we don't have time to really investigate. But as I started going down this journey, I couldn't get rid of that question, what's it? How do I define success? And as I was uh, processing that, God helped me to reexamine, especially the role of how I strategize and how I reach the city together. Who am I supposed to be together with? And maybe the most important one is the spirit of God, that the spirit will enlighten me to who I'm supposed to talk to. It can make all the difference. You know what I found over the last few years? Is in a crazy way, I've been coming here to LA and uh, I see Orange and LA County actually as one. And I go to New York City every month and somehow God leads me to the one. I've met a key leader in the finance area, a hedge fund guy. I just recently met the woman who's considered the, the iconic figure of performing arts right now. She's the legend. Time Magazine says she's the number one performing artist. How did I meet her? Well, I just happened to be invited to a little dinner party from a friend I happened to meet in Mexico City. And she's a fashion designer. She says, I'd like you to meet this woman. I met her in Mercer Kitchen in Soho. She looks at me, she walks in, and she has mentored some of the artists that you know and are the, the greatest pop artists of our day. She looks at me and says, there's something different about you. What is it? You have an energy. What is that energy? Oh, I said, oh, you want to know about it sometime. I don't know if we have time tonight, but it's an energy above all other energies. She goes, I need to talk to you. Can you come to my office? I'd like you to meet my whole staff. I mean, just like that. And suddenly now, I'm an advisor on her staff in her LLC, as well as her nonprofit. I'm now her personal advisor. My daughter and I go to her house last week, her loft in Greenwich Village. And as I'm listening and talking to her and listening to the Spirit of God, suddenly I see it's all about blood. 
because that's the imagery she uses in her performances. And I said, you know, my, my sister, I think what you need today is the blood of Christ. And I think if you wash yourself in the blood of Christ, uh, he'll make you new and you're going to be totally changed. And then she looks at me and says, I want that. Right there in her house, she accepted Jesus. It is a crazy story. And what's so exciting about this is my daughter, who's 21, was with me the whole time. And as she's with me, my daughter took it to the next level because my friend's been all over the place in the world dealing with many different spirits. And my daughter says, hey, why don't we do a cleansing prayer too, that just to make sure everything's kind of cleansed up, you're totally clean. And, she, and then she goes, yeah, I like that. And my daughter went through a cleansing prayer. And my daughter has this unique ability. Again, we don't hype up the supernatural stuff. We think it should be just natural. We don't act all goofy. We just talk about it in normal language. We try to actually take away the weird nomenclature. So we just talk about normal. We say, yeah, why don't we just pray and ask Jesus to maybe clean it up, you know, take the slime away, if there's any slime from places we've been. And so as my daughter's praying, my daughter sees this picture of people really jealous of her. And she goes, I, uh, are people really jealous of you? And she goes, that's my number one thing right now in my life. There's a lot of friends that are jealous. I said, okay, let's pray about that. And we prayed and she goes, I feel so at peace. She goes, what was that prayer you just prayed? Can you write that down? I'm gonna pray that every night. And I go, hey, yeah, let me read you a passage it's called the book of Psalms, and there's like a hymnal for Israel. And uh, it's got a really cool song I think you like. It's like song, it's called number 139. And I said, I read it. And she, she goes, what? Where is that? Where is that Psalm 139? I said, oh, it's in the Bible. She goes, could you send that to me? You know how fun life is? when it's not just simply about human strategy and human thinking. It's the power of and, I call it. It's not that we do away with intellectualism. We do away with thinking deeply and insights. What it's saying is let's not get intoxicated by it because we can get so enamored with it that we're actually not leaning into the power of the spirit. It's a both and. We work our mind and we also work our time with the Holy Spirit and let the Holy Spirit guide us into strategy. And it won't maybe be about mass, the masses, because whenever you think masses and we do, there's a diffusion of energy. We can't figure it out because most of you are not corporate. Most of you cannot run a company that's large. But maybe we can love the one if we listen to the Spirit. We hope you enjoyed this message. Biola University offers a variety of biblically-centered degree programs, ranging from business to ministry to the arts and sciences. Learn more at biola.edu.